Fast Forward Productions, the women are speaking. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the One Broke Actress Podcast, an honest account of actor life plus a few lessons I learn in the process. I am your host, Sam Valentine, and today we have an, a whole group episode because I invited Brittany Baxter, Brendan A. Bradley, and Iris Liu, who were very prolific strike captains and very successful actors, onto this podcast. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Sam, the strike is over. What are you talking about? We have a new contract. We're done with striking. La, la, la. I get it. I totally understand. I know it feels like forever ago. But this episode is not just about the actor strike. This episode is about how to get involved in the union, where you can start, what you can do even if you're not in the union yet, and what volunteerism inside the union actually looks like. It's not exactly a walk in the park. They share the really gritty day-to-day of what this looked like during the strike and how they actually feel like it prepped them to be better actors on set. They share the insight of what it was like working and coordinating for our union and what they learned from being on the front lines of this process every single day. We talk a little bit about what their careers look like from here. And they share some pretty incredible things at the end that happened during the strike. And you're going to want to tune in for the whole thing. The heartfeltness of all three of them is so palpable throughout this episode. And if you ever feel like you feel left out of the union or the union is a separate thing from you. I just want you to come back to this episode and listen to the emotional sincerity with which they all speak about this union and their fellow actor. And I really think it'll inspire you to even just attend a meeting or consider getting involved next time. Without further ado, please enjoy Brittany Baxter, Iris Liu, and Brendan A. Bradley. Thank you guys so much for being here. Will you each do me a favor and introduce yourselves so everyone knows whose voice is whose? And I'll start with Brittany because you're immediately to my right. Hey, I'm Brittany Baxter. Hi. Okay. And then Iris. Hello. My name is Iris Liu. And Brendan. Hello, I'm Brendan Bradley, and this is my voice. When you speak now, this is how I know you're doing a good job branding. I wait for the rest of your spiel. It works. You have not seen me anything, and that's the point. Like, I just I feel it coming. <laughs> it's like your podcast download. So you guys were all front and center strike captains at Paramount, which was the strike location that I frequented the most. It was a very pop-in place, if you will. That and Disney, I feel like, were like the places to go. But the strike is done. It is kaput. We are out of that world. We just, today is December 7th, and I know this podcast won't come out for a little bit for those of you who are listening, but we have just ratified the contract. So like everything has been gently put on ice for now, and now we're going to live in this world of this new contract. So I would love to know from each of you why you decided to jump on the strike captain bandwagon and how it was different than what you thought it was going to be. Because I think union participation is something we don't talk about very often. And you guys were like the face of union participation in so many ways. Anyone can go. I can start. This is Iris again. The two questions, one being what got me involved. I think I have a pretty unique story because I joined the union last year in 2022. Well, now it would have been two years, almost two years if when this is airing, right? But I didn't expect to be so involved, but I, I have always been a very involved person. And so even though I was new to the union, I had been, you know, a couple months into my union membership, I was in the W and W's and I was just learning. I I kind of expected everybody to be a little bit more involved. And so sitting back, I wanted to sit back and learn and listen from my fellow union members. And so if I take a step back, like I started my acting career pretty recently. I've I've been an actor my whole life, but I, for those, this is audio format. I am an Asian American and being very frank, it didn't seem like a wise career choice for much of my life. And so even though I've always loved performing and I've been performing since I was a kid, it was only in the last few years that I felt like a viable career. You know, I worked my ass off for a couple of years pursuing this career and, you know, assumed that as soon as I joined the union, it would be taken care of. That if I continued to work hard and continue to book, you know, I was booking a job every month, right? Commercials and film and TV. And yet I wasn't making enough money. And I started to, in those W's and W's, looking around, seeing people I recognize from TV also say that they weren't making enough money. And it was this tremendous wake-up call that nobody else was going to take care of it. If I, knowing how hard I work and how talented I am, if I don't see a pathway to have a longevity career, who would? And so that was what made me take a more active position in the union because I realized we needed to. 
because if I didn't, I can't expect to have a career. And so I did. And I was hoping for, you know, we, we had, a, we, we won a lot in this contract. We still have more work to do, but it, it was baby steps towards a more possible career for more people, right? Because again, as a, as a person of color breaking into this industry now, we're seeing more and more opportunities, but those opportunities aren't paying what they used to. And so my impulse was to try to get more for my people and everybody. There was a second part about transformation, but I can let someone else talk and then get back to it. Yeah, we can address this part first because I think this is really interesting is like what motivated you because there's so many actors who don't. Like I didn't attend a WWE until I was probably in the union for five years. So I don't know. I think it makes sense to me that you're working a lot when you're super involved. It just kind of checks. It checks. Brendan, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say my journey is not nearly as noble as Iris's. I have been in the union for 17 years and I've been very good at complaining for all 17 of those years. <laughs> and this year I actually decided to become a more active member of my union and to try to actually be integrated. I've served on committees and that led me into thinking, oh, I should run for a delegate or run for some sort of elected position. And then the day one of the writer strike, I was like, oh, this is what we're doing. This is how you serve in 2023. And so I showed up and started supporting the writer's movement. And I actually got nominated to be a strike captain. I was at Warner Brothers most days during the writers and then got assigned to Paramount. And I thought, you know, I'll go for a week as a good sport, but this is very far away from where I live and I don't want to go here. And then I just, it became my identity. I lived at Paramount for 118 days. <laughs> that was my journey into how I got involved. And and I'll shout out Iris because she's too humble to do so, is that Iris and I were part of the first five people. There were only five volunteers assigned to Paramount the first week, which had like a record heat wave and there was really no infrastructure. There was no scheduling system. There was nothing. And we were all working double shifts, including a senior disabled veteran that were literally working double shifts in the heat with really no support and no infrastructure. And Iris and I basically got voluntold, figure it out. And we started creating basically a Google document where everybody could just kind of like brain dump what was missing, what they needed, what might be an idea to solve any problem. And that's how we kind of started getting more volunteers and soliciting more support for the Paramount Strike effort. Love that. How we had to break it? a lot of rules. What <laughs> rules did you break? I love All a broken oh. rule. <laughs> Brendan and I, I used to be a rule follower. I mean, I'm just kind of afraid of like upsetting people in general. Brendan, I don't know how you feel about breaking rules, but per what Brendan said, like people were, people were in danger physically. It was that heat wave, people were passing out and we simply did not have the infrastructure. And Brendan and I looked at each other and we were like, we've been banging on the door asking every single day, day after day, night after night, please, can we get more volunteers? Because we know as, as you all know, like there were, like we had that email sent out and it was like, we knew that there were thousands of active SAG members ready to volunteer. And yet there were five people at Paramount. And so we were asking, please, please, please send more people. Can we ask people, can we sign people up? Can we just put a vest on a person and train them. And we ran into a lot of red tape and, and one, we actually Audrey Moore, sorry, Audrey, to blow up your spot, but Audrey Moore called me a weekend and was like, girl, just do it. Just do it. I know you want to do it. Do it. Don't, you can't wait for permission. I am so grateful to her for doing that. I needed the permission from somebody who had been in the union for more than a year. And so I'm so grateful to Brendan for being like, I mean, he made the Google document, right? I was like helping out, but I'm grateful that we were able to have each other to just be like, look each other in the eyes and say, okay, let's fucking do this. Yeah. Well, when you think of too, like a union structure and how we voted to go on strike and all these things, you'd foresee it as just, okay, great. You just, we're ready. There's a lot of people in this union. So it just is what it is. And then you forget that it, we are the union. Like it is us. And if it wants to get done, like we kind of have to do it. And that I think is the most interesting part of this and what's something that I've learned so much of. So Brittany, when did you fall into this, this big mix <laughs> in your tutu so, on the front lines? So day one, I was mad at Bob. And so I went to Disney and picketed with a lot of other people. And I was going to talk to Audrey because I had already submitted everything to volunteer and I hadn't heard back. And I was going to talk to Audrey that day, but it just didn't feel right. And so that was a Friday. So I think that Monday I decided, no, Paramount's my home. That's where my show films. Paramount means something to me. And I was like, I'm going to go to Paramount and pick it today. And I met Brendan. Brendan handed me my t-shirt and I took off the shirt. 
I had right there in front of everybody. And we laughed at how, you know, the vibe had changed on the line because writers don't change clothes in front of people. And now the actors are here and we're half naked and we're loud. Laughing with Brendan was great. So before I left, I was like, you know what? Screw this. I've already sent like two emails. I filled out the form. I haven't heard from anybody. And I looked at Brendan and I was like, how can I help? What can I do? I have strengths and I can't sit at home. I get very stir crazy, but I have all these jobs that I used to do. And I knew that with my background of what I used to do, I could be of assistance out there. Not only that, but I'm really loud and I'm not afraid to tell somebody to get out of the road, you know? Like, so I was like, okay, no, let's do it. So Brendan was like, we'll see you tomorrow, basically, is what I think happened. And that was it. Day five might have been my first actual day, something like that. But no, I got I got tired of waiting. And so I showed up on the line and I was like, give me a job. I took charge of that. Yes. So I think the theme that really emerged from so much of this is that we were all in the same boat again, very COVID-like, and everyone reacted in different ways. And I loved the way that you guys took on the strike in being like, well, this is what we're doing now, and here we are, and this is how we're going to do it, and we're going to dress in theme, or we're going to like show up, and we're going to tell people to stay out of the road, and we're just going to guide humans in this like sidewalk, like human directional arrows. It, it was There's so much and so much joy and pep that you guys brought to a situation where a lot of people chose to see only the negative. So I would love to know how this ended up looking for you on a personal level versus kind of what you thought the strike was going to be like. I thought, honestly, we were going to go out there. We were going to be annoying and disruptive and we were going to be loud and we were going to be in the way and all of those things that you see on TV of what a strike is. I think the writer strike was what you would see on TV. You know what I mean? Except for you know, the food trucks and the bands and everything, you know, it was what you see on TV when they're showing people on strike. But when we went on strike, it was a completely different ball game. And I think it's because we are loud and we are outspoken and we do have a lot of opinions and we do not hold our opinions to ourselves. As an actor, if we're having a bad day, you know we're having a bad day. Like, we're going to tell you because we don't care. We have to open ourselves up and be an open book at all times. And I think that's what happened on the picket lines. So for me, what I was going into, I was like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to march and we're going to chant and we're going to do all these things. And some people got offended by this. And some people tried to call us out on this. We had fun. People didn't like that we were having fun on the picket line. And they're like, this is not what you're supposed to do. And I'm like, then go to another picket line. This is how we're getting through this. We got there. It ended up being something different than what we thought it would be. We had fun on a picket line and we made friends and we built a family. And at the end of the day, we're still all hanging out because we like each other and we rely on each other for feedback or, you know, like Iris, I'm headed into a callback. Go get them, babe. Knock them dead. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's things like that, that I didn't expect to come from this at all, especially the pineapple hat. Okay. Like yeah. that was <laughs> shock, honestly, but the relationships, the relationships that were built completely unexpected for me. I did not, not in the least. And I've said it a hundred times. And I just, I just got off the phone with my agent and I told her this it was like, I've been watching you and you decided you were going to do something and you got out there and you did it. You didn't sit on your butt the whole strike. You didn't sit there and complain. You got out there and you said, no, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right. And we're going to do it fun. And we're going to be annoying and loud and people are going to be mad at us. But I've said it so many times that we went on strike hoping for a contract. We knew we were going to get a contract. No matter what it was, the contract was coming. I didn't know that in the end I was going to walk away. And that was totally and completely unexpected. And honestly, to me, I'd do it all over again to have these people in my life all over again. Those are the survival mechanisms of, of, I think, actors who make it, is the people who can take a situation that doesn't look like what they wanted it to look like and make a community out of it, have a good time with it. Like, that's such a through line I'm, I'm starting to sense with people. So that's pretty amazing. Iris, did you see this as being a thing? I mean, you're on the – I feel like you're – like everyone's Instagram is like – blown up and it's like you and you know Jack Black every other day Iris and like all these people. 
I, I think it's so funny that like my very last strike post is like me talking about making a movie with Jack Black. I was like, that ended the strike. The the demand for a movie with Jack Black and me. And how we asked him to keep his clothes on. Final line of the strike. <laughs> I, I think it's funny reflecting on what you said, Brittany, that we were having fun and that we like when we're having a bad day or like everyone knows. And I, I kind of had maybe an opposite experience where I felt like because we were in this leadership position, we weren't allowed to have bad days. I felt a lot of responsibility to be brave and strong in the public eye, both on the line and on online and on the line. Every single one of our strike captains was going through something and they still chose to come when they were having bad days. We felt bound to a duty of being there for other people having bad days. So our membership, regular people, a lot of people came to the line for a sense of community, for a bright light in an otherwise dark summer, food, their only meal. And so I felt kind of the opposite effect. Of course, I was having fun some days, but it didn't really matter if I was having fun because I was there to get a job done. And part of that job was making it look like fun. Part of that job was greeting every single person that looked at me, that looked lost, that maybe it was their first day or maybe that got scared about a car. I was there to catch them, whether it was physically or emotionally. I don't know what it was that made me feel that I needed to do that, but that is a burden that I think that I didn't necessarily need to take on, but I did. And it was tremendously difficult to be there every day because we are human beings. We are very sensitive people. We are actors. We don't often have to be anywhere every single day. And, you know, this work continued. It wasn't just the hours on the on the picket line. It continued, you know. Someone asked me, what do I do after I get? Sarah Mornell asked me, okay, so what happens after, you know, you're here for three hours? You go home. What do you do to relax? Like, relax. I get home. I eat my first meal of the day. I look at all the pictures that I took. I curate, I spend three hours creating content, posting it to my thing, making sure tomorrow's schedule looks okay, figuring out who needs what from me, joining a captain Zoom for two hours, reading the Discord for three hours, checking in who has a personal crisis and can't be there tomorrow, and then I go to bed, then I wake up and do it all over again. That was 118 days, and that is a not sustainable. I, I think. I am so fucking ready to be a series regular. I did that. I was a series regular on the line. I went to go see my agent like in June and she was like, you are one audition away from a series regular. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Okay, sure. Claiming that. But in my heart, I was like, I don't, I don't believe you. And after this summer, any show would be lucky to have me. <laughs> like I proved that to myself. It was like, I was there every single day. I was, I was at in front of Paramount. We were all in front of Paramount more than any series regulars on set for one season. Well, and you weren't getting paid. You were just showing up without You guys weren't money. getting paid? Wait, I actually had to ask Iris one day because I had someone who's a writer and they were like, we heard this, that, that like SAG uh, strike <laughs> captains were getting paid. And I was like, I'm 99.9% positive that that is absolute garbage. And I was like, Iris, can you just confirm something for me? And she was like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> it's like, of <laughs> course not. Where yeah, would the money and come t-shirts. from? We got in like taco tr- and like, you know, shabby pretzels. <laughs> like that was, that was what you guys got paid in, which is not, which is just, you know, the best snack and also like short lived energy. <laughs> oh, Brendan, how do you feel about that? How do you feel like you thought this was going to look like as a strike captain versus what it actually was? Sure. I mean, I think just to kind of dovetail on what Iris was saying, you know, you talked about when we first started the podcast that we're kind of like number one on the call sheet at Paramount for the strike. And we actually did make a call sheet for Paramount that we sent out every night because we're nerds. But we talk about top of call sheet behavior because we've all been on a set that was led by someone who created a good culture. And we've all been on sets with people who created a bad culture. And I think that there is that invisible responsibility to the job that a lot of people don't talk about. We, t- we hear this with showrunners a lot or directors a lot, but the responsibility of an actor who is the head of the family and defining what the boundaries of that family are, what is appropriate behavior and appropriate conflict management. But I think to Iris's point that mom's not allowed to have a bad day. You know, mom has to shut the bedroom door to go cry. And that's not fair to mom. 
we need to give our leaders that same grace and that same space. But I think for me, I did feel like I was the responsibility of making sure that I took care of the team before I worried about me. Obviously, that's not sustainable, but at the same time, I, I didn't see another path forward. And I do equate it to being on a set. And I think that a lot of us out there on the line as actors, we're, we're showing up in a way for our career that I think will only make us stronger on set because we now know what it is to lead and champion an entire team and an entire crew and be a, a constructive part of a team and a crew, all in service of a singular mission. And I hope that the solidarity we built with our crews and with our writers will only enhance that feeling of camaraderie as we all enter the next chapter of our careers. Yeah. What did you guys learn about the union, our union, that you didn't know before? <laughs> Yeah, how spicy do we want this to be? <laughs> and it can be, listen, it, it, we don't have to, this is not like all flowers and roses, right? Like there was, <laughs> there was a lot. I mean, yeah, there was a lot we all learned about how things function and like how things work. And it's, it was not, nothing is seamless. Nothing is perfect. No group organization has ever been perfect in the history of mankind because humans have opinions, and, you know, issues with money and power. So what did you learn? A stressful environment reveals the fractures that were already there. And I think that we have a very well-documented and well-discussed frustration within our union of people feeling like there isn't necessarily communication, isn't transparency. This is all stuff that came out really during those town halls around the 18-page summary and the MOA. I can add on. Again, as I mentioned up top, I'm still fairly new to the union. So during this strike was the first election, which is also a cluster to have an election during a strike. Yeah. Yeah. It was messy. Exactly. So there, there were just <laughs> these, these common sense things that I feel like most of our membership hadn't opened their eyes to that were surprising. And one thing that I can say for certain is that this historic strike lit a fire under people's butts who otherwise wouldn't have been involved. Like I said, Sam, you have a chunk of pre-union audience. And as someone who was recently pre-union, like I said, I thought it would all be figured out. By the time I joined the professional actors union that has been a union, I thought it would be like, I am finally a big girl in a big girl world. Really illuminated that we all take control of our own careers. That applies in the union as well, that the union is us. I think as someone in the union, I came in with a lot of optimism. I came in with, okay, show me. Show me how I can get involved. I'm going to learn and I'm going to listen. What I was really surprised by because I was so eager and, and optimistic about the strike authorization vote, the W and W's, all of this stuff. And I would come to my classes and I have just random relationships with people who have had long careers. So I was just so surprised when I spoke to people who were like, oh, well, you know, SAG, like people who'd been in the, in the union for over 10 years or 20 years or 25 years or 30 years would be like, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, SAG. I just don't have confidence that they're going to be able to do this. And I got so frustrated because there is no they're not going to be able to do this. You mean to say we? That's fine if that's what you believe. But how dare you put the onus and the responsibility on anyone but yourself if you are not also part of the solution? And yet now experienced a lot of that red tape and bureaucracy and confusion and like what in the what is going on with our union I understand the frustration and now I hope that mm. people can understand that we made a ton of progress in this last year with engagement and with outcomes it was because we didn't shut up about it on all sides of the fence right people were like I want to read a contract and they're like what the hell it's never been done before. Now we say, okay, doesn't matter. It's never been done before, but this time it has to be done. And so we need to make our voices heard 
the union that serves us. And we need to flip the script because of course staff that's been there who's never seen an active membership isn't going to assume that anyone's going to read a 128 page document if our voter turnout was 16% in 2014 and then 15% in 2017 and then 27% in 2020, right? Like Luckily, this year it was 38%, which is 55,000 votes, which is amazing. But I'm excited for people to put their money where their mouth is or their mouth where their money is. It's because we are only as powerful as our union and we are only as powerful as we are when we engage. All of that. <laughs> what else can you say that we like? That was literally for 118 days, that was the discussion about the union. We even talked about it last night. Iris and I did. And we talked about it night before it last that we have not steered clear of for simple things that the one thing that I would love to see more of, because I am a communicator. And when I was running events and stuff, the communication, like every, I looked at the picket line every day, every day was an event. Every single day was a different event, no matter what it was. And then when we had the big rally, that was a big event. That was a large event. And Iris and I had the lot that day, you know, and there were some things that we asked for and some things that we requested. And the communication was as good as communicating with my seven-year-old, you know, yeah. it's like, sorry, Maverick, you're right yeah. now. Um, but, but yeah. it was a matter <laughs> of, we're not, we weren't asking for much. Like the city of LA would have provided the rails that we wanted to contain certain areas. But it was simple, like to me, the communication, the lack of communication, it drove me nuts to the point where the five of us were together a couple nights ago when we were waiting on the vote and we were taking bets on how we were going to get the news. <laughs> how are we going to get it? Wait, yeah. I was doing a similar one. I was like, I have the news open and I have my email open. And I was like, which comes first, is it gonna be the chicken or the egg? Is it going to be Hollywood Reporter? Is it going to be TMZ? Like, where is it going to get leaked to first before the membership gets an email that it's been ratified or not or whatever? You know what I mean? Like that was the conversation for most of the night before we got the news. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, it's, it's an email. <laughs> you know, and then it's, but I'm from the South. We communicate. We talk and we talk a lot. And that for me was literally like, like cringeworthy. I need communication. Yeah. I, I can't help it. I need it. So for those who are listening who are current members, how would you guys direct them to better utilize their union concerns, issues, than the question of, which I think gets thrown on a lot, oh, SAG. And it's like, bitch, you are SAG. <laughs> like, you are SAG because it is you. So I, it took me years to figure this out, by the way. It took me years to get involved in the union. So Iris, you are so ahead of where I was in my career. I just thought that you had to join SAG to get to the next thing. I saw it as a task and not a team. As I've started to understand it more, I know there is things that we as members could do better to get ourselves to that. So what do you guys see as those things that current members can do to better serve their union so some of this friction doesn't exist as much anymore? Very simply, I we have to speak up. We can't sit and watch anymore. And I think the strike has done that for a lot of people, but we can no longer just be like, eh, it's just how SAG works. No, it's how SAG used to work. We are not gonna let it work that way anymore. We've gotta ask questions, we have to speak up. Like we're allowed to give our opinion, we pay the dues. We are the union. It is our union. Yes, it's there to protect us. It's there to do all these amazing things for us. But in the end, and it's one thing that we kept hearing on the line, you guys are the members. You got to do it. You guys are the members. Okay, so as members, we cannot sit on our hands anymore. We cannot keep our mouths shut. If there's a concern, we need to address it. If there's a question, we need to ask it. We've got to stop shrugging and saying, ah, that's the way it works. Because it's not, we now know it's not the way it works. For sure. Beyond <laughs> a comment section on an Instagram post, where would you tell people to take these opinions to? Committees, W&W, &W, running for elected service. I think that one of the most missed opportunities right now, I, you know, for example, I, I really did hear and receive, despite what my DMs say, the concerns that people had about the AI components of this contract. And I agree, 99% of them having worked in this technology since 2017. But the way we enact that change, I think we get to decide if we want to be this rogue faction on the outside telling the union they suck, 
Mission accomplished. We are a rogue faction on the outside of the Union, not integrating any change, just shouting at them going, you're terrible. But if we want to affect change within an institution, which for better or worse, sag after is an institution, we have to frustratingly, methodically follow the systems in place and change those systems if we don't like them. That is part of the whole delegate process with resolutions at convention is to change our actual constitutional language for how we affect change within our union. And yes, that is slow. And as someone who has always hated bureaucracy and government, I know how awful that is. But what I will say is, you know, I gained a real sense of perspective in 2016, watching a certain administration nationally have to move very slowly and methodically. They cannot F up stuff quite as fast as they wanted to because we had that bureaucracy in place. And so sometimes there are good gates and learning how to work within those good gates to affect meaningful change. And I, what I will say is that, for example, I've been on the new technology committee for several years now. I intend to continue to be a part of that committee. Anybody can join. We're just a Zoom call that happens once a quarter, which is very frustrating. However, we're allowed to announce subcommittees or work groups that can meet whenever they'd like to and enact in whatever change or recommendations they want for us as a larger committee to vote up. So what I would say is all this great energy outside of the union, we really need to foster and shepherd inside the union so that it can actually make the change that we all want it to make. Because I think we're all on the same page that we want these changes to get made. It's just a matter of, are we going to do that from outside of the institution or inside of it? I want to respect the fact that this is also all volunteer service. I think that was a tremendously difficult element of the strike and like leading on the picket lines was that Brittany, Brendan and I, we were there and at the expense of not finding other work. Like every day we were out on the line, we were forgoing possible money, doing anything else. I think about, you know, I was on unemployment. I am on unemployment. It ran out. I was able to be on the, on the line because I had and savings from my old job. A lot of our membership has a second, a third job. You know, we have to be cognizant of, of the fact that most of our membership actually can't afford not to be working other jobs. And that was that was part of why I was out there. I was like, I want I want people to be able to just do acting because acting is a full time job and the pursuit of a career is a full time job. And so I don't blame people for not finding the time to to volunteer, you know, countless hours to do this type of bureaucratic bullshit when they have families to take care of and bills to pay and a career. However, all of this energy, interest, there is a spectrum for it. People can tune in just for the contract ratification or just for the W&Ws. Like, it doesn't have to be a, okay, now my whole identity is union leader for the rest of time. It can be, let me have a conversation with any strike captain. Let me have open ears and then help get out the vote. Tune in and, and have conversations and know that like we can all participate in the union in the ways that we can make room for. And it's not all or nothing at all. I see you. You're sitting in your car right now listening to this podcast thinking, oh, it's that time of year. I guess I should really get some new headshots. After the strike last year, I look a little different. I feel a little different. Maybe I want to get a new agent. Maybe I need to make my agent happier. Oh my God, I should just go sign up for headshots right now. And immediately you go into a panic mode, not knowing what you're going to do. How do you get the right headshots? Fast forward to the headshot class. Dun, dun, dun. We are teaching a headshot class between Sam and I, and you guys are invited. Yes. Guys, if you enjoy listening to myself and Gabrielle talk about our working actor life, we have learned so much about headshots and we are putting it all down for you guys. We get more questions about that than probably anything else. So we have decided to make a full class about it, specifically how to decide what it is your package is missing, how to get the headshots that fit those holes, and how to do them Right. Not only that, but we also have some stuff leading up to it. Sam has a bunch of different podcasts coming out that's going to be all about the different photographers and what they like the best out of actors. You might even be listening to one of them now. So we are setting you up 
That way you can join the headshot class and know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And by the end of it, know exactly what you need for your headshots. If this sounds like something you guys are looking for, and trust me, you need this class. I wish I would have had it so long ago. I've saved so much time and so much money. The class is February 16th. It will be 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, all held over Zoom. So anywhere across the world, you can join in from. We will be doing a live work session where you guys will be able to work on the notes we give you. We will give you a full headshot guide. We will take you through the steps to get the shots you're missing. And there's even going to be follow-up afterwards. So we're going to make sure everyone gets all the information they need for their next headshots. And just in case you're wondering, what happens if you register for this class and you get booked and you can't actually be there? Don't you worry. It will be recorded and you will get your own recording because we want you to be able to use this in the future on other headshots as well. So think of it as an investment, not only for your headshots now, but for your headshots in the future. Oh, the amount of money I could get back if I could have this class first. Guys, sign up anywhere in the show notes for this podcast. It will also be linked in both of our social medias. Let us know if you can't find the link. We will definitely link you to it. We are so excited and spots will fill up fast because this is prime headshot time. So get signed up, get the guidance you need and stop getting shitty headshots. And my plea would be have respect for the people who do make it their whole identity. Have some courtesy for the people who are spending valuable time that they could be either pouring into a a side job or pouring into their own acting careers or pouring into their family and friends and personal life who are choosing to pour it into union service for the betterment of our whole industry. Be kind to them because no matter what you agree with or disagree with, every single strike captain sacrificed a lot to be out there. Every single negotiating committee member sacrificed a lot to be there. Even our president, you know, Fran Drescher, sacrifices a lot to be there. It's unpaid. I just ask that whatever engagement continues, you don't have to do it all. But like, that's one of the challenges that we have is that the more we engage with the union, there's the opportunity cost of just putting your head down and, 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 and doing the career. I think if I can offer my transformation over the course of this year because of my union services, I feel in control. I feel like an active participant in this professional industry in a way that I didn't prior to the service. I gained my voice back because I have always known my worth. But the question has been, can other people see it? And for whatever reason, as I, as I spoke to in the beginning of this, of this interview, right, is that I had a lot of doubts about whether or not Hollywood could see my value because people like me have not historically been valued in this industry. I know I am valued. Brendan tells me every day. Brittany tells me every day. And it's not about being valued just by the quote unquote gatekeepers of our industry, right? Casting directors, directors, producers. It's about being valued as an artist and as a participant. And we can find value when we give value. You know, when we, when we work towards something together and it's not about all of that other stuff. It's about let's contribute. I'll tell you outright, I went to a captain training meeting and I was like, I can't do this. I don't have time. I went to a full training meeting and I sat and I was like, oh no. I was like, how do I tell them I can't do this? I can't do this. I employ four other actors. I have to work my jobs like because then they'll lose their jobs. And I was like, oh no. And it turned out to be fine. Like we didn't need me there necessarily. But that pull I felt to join in. Also, I'm like kind of jealous because I feel like we did. Summer camp we together and I wasn't there. <laughs> well, super jealous, Brittany. Thanks so much. <laughs> what you guys created though is something that I think you did it in a way that people could view it and see what you were doing. And you all did it publicly. You didn't just, like you said, Iris, put your head down and like whatever. The fact that you not only showed up every day and then spent the time to share it on social media, you guys know I'm the biggest proponent of like, share the hard parts, share the days that you're not on set, share all of this stuff. And you guys did it so beautifully during that. And for anyone who's listening, who's like, yeah, but I couldn't have done that because I don't have a commercial money. I've not booked very much. I'm not, I totally get it. I couldn't do it either. But I think what we're seeing is a potential of go to a meeting and just listen. That's all I do at this point. Every time, Iris, you talked in the WWs, I was like, what she said. Yes, that. Like, agreed. Self-tapes, uh, longer turnaround. Yes, please. Like, all that stuff. I learned so much just from attending and listening. And that was me being on Zoom while I vacuumed. You guys are the example of what this volunteer position could look like. But I also want to open up to the listeners that, like, you don't have to dedicate 118 days to the union. You could just go to a meeting, like, once a quarter. 
And that starts with, by the way, signing up for the union emails, which I know are not always <laughs> formatted well and They've gotten so much better than they're not always the easiest things to read, but like they're better than they used to be. You know, there's like potential ways that people could start to tiptoe into this pond that is it's your motherfucking pond to understand what is happening, even if you can't do anything right now. I'll echo that just by saying that I think we also don't necessarily realize how important our lens into the industry is because it is such an individuated path for all of us. And so often, you know, we talk about this with even like high profile celebrities where they're like, tell each other what you're making because some shady stuff might be happening and you deserve to get your bag. And the same thing has happened, of course, with, you know, predatory practices and toxic onset behavior. It's part of the burn it down book. And so in in some ways, like your anecdotes, your stories, what would be your personal W and W's share them, talk about your onset journey and your onset experiences and the ways that you've been screwed out of what you were owed in a contract so that then we know to put those into protections. The biggest thing that stuck with me through this whole movement with like even Duncan at the town hall of saying our biggest method of enforcement is being able to take those claims and throw them on the table and say, we have a hundred proven documented instances where you violated this Mm -hmm. contract. Now, what are we going to do about that? And so many of us are just filled with this shame of going, I have to take the scraps. I can't push back. I have no power. And know that that power within at least our union, within at least our community, is us all having each other's backs and being able to share that and go, yeah, that happened to me too. Is this a bigger problem than we think it is? We should be talking about this. Yeah. And I, we are doing a whole podcast this year dedicated to showing everyone how to file a claim with SAG because- I want everyone to understand how to do it because I don't know how to do it. So I'm going to teach oh, you all fun. while I learn because I think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn and then I got a check for $3,500 and I was like, that was worth it. <laughs> worth it. <laughs> worth it. Worth it. <laughs> yes. But yeah. This is one of my dedicated moments. Like next year, we're going to have that. It's going to be a podcast and YouTube video because I think people need to know, understand how to do these because there's so many small things. But you guys, you guys were the face of so much, of so much in this time. Is there anyone that you guys want to thank for being your support during this? You're looking at my support. If I got there and I was having a bad day or if I had a bad moment or anything that happened, it was these two. I mean, mostly for me. There were other people, yeah, of course. If shit hit the fan here at home and I got to the line and I didn't want to do anything that day except walk around and take people water, Brendan told me, he was like, no, that's great. You know? I feel like there are too many people to thank. And here's my brain going into leadership mode, like mom and dad mode. It's like, you can't pick your favorite kids. Everyone's going to be upset. So like, (laughs) I'm not going to say anything, but I will. I do want to, I do want to thank my partner. He probably won't listen to this. (laughs) Yeah, I'll make him. Uh, He should. That's rude. Just tell him to download it. Um, (laughs) I feel like I am grateful every day that I came to this career when I did, which is to say that I have a strong support system in my personal life that I have worked very hard for. And that includes my partner who every single day, because I have, I'm lactose intolerant. And so I couldn't eat any of the pizza or the pastries like without problems. And so I would not eat unless I was having a really bad day. I would eat the food and then be upset about it, but I would come home to a sandwich. No matter what time I came home, I would come home to a sandwich on the table, cold water. And that's when I would sit there, right? I would sit and do the two hours of Instagram, like that I would have eaten. I would eat that sandwich and, and post. And, you know, that's a very small example. I mean, he also helped cover our rent for two months, three months. Oh, I love it. And, you know, a, a partnership is a, is a give and take, right? I, I He's taking care of me, blah, blah, blah. I thought about that a lot, how lucky I am to have a partner who was willing to be ignored for six months because I was so deep in it. And he respected that this was a historic moment for me and for a lot of people. And he never made me feel bad about getting too sucked in. He was always there to listen and always, always, Mm. you know, always there. And so I I just want to shout him out. I love you. I love that. I love (laughs) the sandwich thing. That makes me really happy. It's the little things. It really is. Brendan, what about you? I think just echoing the little things, I I think that, you know, there's no small parts and there's no small service. I think every single person that showed up, even in the comments or the DMs, I hate social media and I hate making social media content. Uh, doesn't seem well, like you, a real thing. Yeah, you're a good actor but, then. <laughs> like, but I, it, it, I really have, and I hate all of it. But 
I think that you get to that point of just going like, is this navel gazing? Is the, does this matter? Is this narcissistic? And is this gross? And just having someone from Boston or from Nebraska contact me and just say, Hey, we don't, we can't have a strike here. Like there aren't strike locations for us to go to. And me feeling like I get to be a part of the strike every day is, is incredibly important to me. And I feel informed and thank you for having a neutral position on everything. And so just commenting or DMing was immensely powerful to just checking in and showing up for me in a huge way and giving me strength and sustainability. But likewise, there are so many people that were out on the line to walk their dog for the first half hour every morning or who would come by because they had an audition for a commercial in the neighborhood or Robert, one of our strike captains, would literally pass by on his scooter to his day job every single day and come take a bag of <laughs> chips and give everybody a hug and then go off into the sunset or the sunrise. And just having that interface, those small interactions every single day, I think that's what that community that we were building is all about. And I think that's what it is for each of us. The next time you see people in an audition room or see people on set, it's not about volume. It's about intention. I'm going to leave us with one last question because that was really beautiful. For our pre-union members who are listening, who feel like this is not yet their fight or they feel out of it, or maybe they're just looking at your guys' credits and being like, I want to be Britney and say my show films at Paramount. I want to talk about my shit. I want to say things. What would you say to our current non-union members? We all were non-union at one point in time. Like that is the journey. There's no shame in that. Like that's literally how all of us start. <laughs> so you're exactly on the path and on your journey. And that doesn't differentiate you at all. I still have the first dollar I ever made performing at a cafe. That's being a professional entertainer. That is all that it takes is you were engaged to do a job and you did that job. And so it is all work with integrity and you should feel not othered or different than at all. And, and you are exactly where you need to be in that journey. And we will welcome you when you get here. I would say don't do anything in perpetuity. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 okay, contract. that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like an, I like an emotional, yeah. I like an emotional yeah. role like, and then like the a tactile takeaway. <laughs> go do something else. We really are the parents. Yeah here. I'm like, we love you, sweetie. And you're like, don't yes, make the bad, bad choices. choices. <laughs> I'm joking, but I'm also very serious in that like, yeah. this is your fight. Yeah, for sure. This is your fight more than it is our fight. We have a union to protect us. You don't yet. I will just say though, and this is the sneakiest sneaky of all sneakies. If you work under a union contract or a union job, even if you are non-union, you are protected yes. by the full parameters of that yes. contract. So if you are Taft heart lead or your background mm -hmm. or whatever, you are working under. So, and there's a whole part of SAG dedicated to bringing projects into union signatory yes. agreements. So convert those projects and say you want union protections, even if they don't apply to yes. you. Yes. And you can call SAG at any time, even if you're not a union member. So if you have a question about a shady, you know, you see a non-union commercial and you're like, this probably should be union. You can call SAG and they can get that non-signatory team on to try to convert that project. And so just because you haven't qualified for your card does not mean you don't need to or cannot engage in getting fair work protections. This fight is out there in the world, legal, all that stuff, but it's also internal. It is about valuing yourself and your craft and your professional work product. And that happens regardless of whether or not you have a union card, but that happens inside, right? Like I know so many people who are, you know, SAG eligible, but they're, you know, waiting to join the union. I will say, when I knew I was ready to join the union, it was when I had, I was getting so many non-union commercials auditions still, right? And I was like, so pissed off. I was like, this isn't even worth my time to read it. It is a waste of my time to read and process and decide whether or not I want to do this project for this Fortune 500 company for no pay. It's not worth it. And I was ready to join when I was like, I have to worry about whether or not it's worth my time to read this audition notice. Now I just can scan it and be like, great, because it's SAG scale and it's going to be good enough. I would say to somebody who's non-union, because there were people who felt like they couldn't come join us on the line because they were non-union. The goal in this career is for it to be a career and for you to not have to have a, a survivor job or as some of us joke and call them normal careers. I've told a few people that are like, this isn't my fight. You may not feel like it's your fight because you weren't union, but we were fighting for you. What some people have to realize is 
how long is this contract? So are you saying that we weren't fighting for you for this contract because you're not a member now and you're not going to join until after the next contract? No, if you join under this contract, the fight that we put out there, it wasn't just for us. We kept saying, this is to save our industry. This is for the future of what our industry looks like. It's not today. It's the future. And then this contract should build for the next one. This is a great foundation to build for the future. And if you join in 2024, 2025, this was your fight as much as it was ours because you're under the same contract. But non-union work is not always easy. You don't get paid well to do sometimes the same exact thing. But like to piggyback on what Iris said, when I joined several of my friends and I all at the same time, and I knew that I was ready to join. There was no doubt I had my money ready. You know, I was ready. And they were like, eh, I just don't know. And it, like, why did you join? I was like, do you feel it? Do you feel like this is something that you want as a career and something you want to be a part of? And they were like, maybe. I'm like, then you're not ready. I was ready. And I knew the work would cut back. I knew I would lose work. I didn't care. You know, you just know. I sat on a SAG panel once with someone who was like, I joined because there's no such thing as a non-union Marvel movie. <laughs> I was like, that's a good fucking point. <laughs> this has been lovely. I could talk to you all for another hour, but will you give your handles and where people can follow you? Any projects you have coming up? Because now you can like blast them to the rooftops. Anything that came up over the strike that you want to share about? Like, please, by all means, promote yourself. Go, Brendan. Oh, I'm Brendan A. Bradley. All of the places, unless you're going to say mean things and then I am not on social media, please don't find me. I was very fortunate in that during this whole endeavor, I became pre-WGA. A movie I wrote was released in theaters and I couldn't promote it. And I was very excited that that happened. I also have two movies going into the festival circuit that I'm the lead of next year that I'm just very excited to like get to do like really meaty, exciting acting work where it's me for the whole darn movie. And then I do live virtual reality theater. And I was touring around the world doing that to pay the bills intermittently between the strike line. Amazing. So fucking cool. Congrats, Thanks. man. That's I major. know. Now I don't want to go. <laughs> now I'm going to make you go. Now I'm going to make you go, Brittany. <laughs> uh, Brittany's the one who's about to go back to work, Hi. probably. My name is Brittany Baxter. <laughs> like, I feel like so like it's uh, but I will say this though, B-R-I-T-T-N-E-Y, okay? That's where you'll find me, everywhere. Just Brittany Baxter, the red curly hair. We are currently waiting to hear if Frasier is going to be renewed for season two. I mean, I'm sure by the time this comes out, we're going to know. But, you know, right now we're we're holding for network. That's the goal for me. I I took that as a background role because I wanted to be part of the legacy. And I got there during a rehearsal day and they asked me to run a couple things and do some stuff. And then Jimmy Burroughs and Kelsey Grammer decided that apparently it was for me. And Richard Silva sat me down and said, we'd love to have you all season. So that's what happened. Now we're just waiting very patiently. That's a dream scenario. That's awesome. It was a gift. It was truly, truly, truly a gift. Hell yeah. So, and I'll never take it for granted. Mm. Okay, all the vibes. Frasier season two. Love, love, love. Sending them. Sending them. Sending yes, them. okay. So I am on Instagram a lot at Iris Lou Official. I am thrilled to be able to promote two things that came out during the strike. One was super cool. I was on the season finale of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That was freaking awesome. And now dudes love me. Dudes love that show. So I can't tell you how many people came out of the woodwork from like middle school, high school, college, all dudes, all dudes. Somehow they still have my number. Like, a, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, did I just see you on my favorite show? That's so freaking cool, man. Like, I can't believe it. Like, that's really cool. So I am now very cool. And another thing that was really, really exciting was I was on the pilot episode of a new show on Hulu called The Other Black Girl. We're also waiting for season two. It was my first guest star. It was a possible recurring. You find out later whether or not you're in recur. Um, and I, I did not recur yet. But if there's a season two, who knows? I have a name, I have a character, and it was 
it was really freaking cool to be a part of like the creation of a show, right? Episode 101, straight to series. It was really amazing. It's a really amazing story. Great show. Check it out on Hulu. I do just want to share and celebrate because when I was in that process, it was, the, you know, the biggest role that I had gotten yet. And of course, that came with so much imposter syndrome. Literally, like when I booked it, I couldn't believe it. And mm -hmm. then when it was like table reads, I couldn't believe it. And I just was like, we're we going on a studio to table read on Zoom. Wonderful. And ironically, it was like also a day that I was on set for something else. I was on a one day on, on Fatal Attraction and it was literally during my one day there. And I had to take the table read, the studio table read, network studio table read in the makeup chair for another show. It was wild. This was a year ago or like October. So wild. Freaking out, right? Because I'm like, I have to go to set. And I was able to do like the first 10 pages that I'm in. And then Boop. I couldn't even like stay on the table read. I had to go. But I remember with all that imposter syndrome, I hopped on and met the director and one of the producers in just like a 10 minute Zoom, like four weeks after I was booked, right? Had no contact <laughs> until that one like 10 minute Zoom. And I'm like, hi, you guys still want me? And the director said, which I'm still like processing. She was like, we love you. You were our unanimous choice. I still haven't fully processed that because it was such a whirlwind, but I want to like reflect a little bit on that, which was that for whatever reason, I was, it was so hard for me to believe that I deserved to be there. I couldn't believe that I could have been the unanimous choice. Like it was just one Zoom audition, but I want to put that out there here and, and, and claim it and, and try to accept it kind of in a public forum that like, that's really fucking cool. And after, after this coming into our own power over the strike, like, hell yeah, it was the unanimous, unanimous choice. Like, hell yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to of who I am out here. I would like to remind you at the top of this podcast that you said, I've always known my worth. And I think it's interesting that how fast that we can phase in and out of that feeling, especially when it comes to this career. So I love you owning it. I love you sharing it with the audience. You guys all have such specific stories about – from an outside perspective, you could easily say, oh, they just lucked into all these things that are happening for them. But it makes so much sense to me that your face deep in the union – making change, showing up for other people, and your acting career lines up with that. It makes all the sense in the world. And if anyone's listening to this and has been like wishy-washy on attending a meeting or doing something, this should be proof that when you start to put your career into your own, even just understanding, I'm not saying it's going to directly affect your acting career, but it's going to have a positive impact. That's really cool, you guys. I'm so proud of being in this Zoom room with you guys. Thank you so much for your time. I will tag you in all of the things, and I appreciate each and every one of you so much. Well, and thank you to you, Sam. You do so much to champion so many different actors in so many different parts of their path. I'm a fanboy just watching your path. Like, I cried at your getting healthcare for the first time because that's how I was when I got healthcare for the first time. And so just thank you for everything you do to champion all these stories and all of us. Yes. Thank you, Sam. I want to also say, you know, I joined and did this. I, I started, my career started not too long ago. And you and Audrey Moore, I listened to every single one of your podcasts to get up to speed on what I needed to know. And so much of my success is due to you. So thank you very much, Sam, for sharing your career and, and so that we don't, that we can learn from you and then make the same mistakes. <laughs> And be like, she was right. <laughs> over and over again. Because Iris was someone who was like, sent me a message on Instagram one day. And I was like, hey, I'm working on this play. Do you want to come to it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> and then you couldn't even go that night. You showed up late because you had a commercial. Like, it's just a fun. It's such a fun world. When you make this into a community and not a competition world, it's so much more fun to be in. So thank you guys so much. It's so much more fun. And Brittany, I know you dedicate your Absolutely. career to me as well. So 100% of so much. it. Every bit of it. I started watching your podcast when I got my first TV show when I was nine years old. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Best dermatologist on the fucking planet. <laughs> Share your secrets. <laughs> Botox. That's the whole secret. That's the whole thing. Botox and sunscreen. Iris has to get out of here. She has to go to a callback. You guys, thank you so much for your time. And everyone listening, I will talk to you next week.